Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. Now, here's your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to God. Good morning. You have survived it. You made it through the week. It is Friday. The weekend is upon you. Praise be to God. Pornography use surges, especially during the uh, Facebook outage. Numbers are blowing up. The question becomes, will saints rise to counter this present age? We're going to have a conversation today with uh, Charles Colomb from the Tumblr House about Blessed Charles of Austria, how he attempted to rise to meet the challenges, the difficulties, the abuses, the sinfulness of his contemporaries in, in his age, and how we have to have a call for a new group, a new crop of saints living good and holy lives to counter the, uh, insane, the insanity of our time. That's going to be our show today. So it ought to be very, very good. Praise be to God. And then, of course, it's Friday. So in the second hour, for everybody who joins us in our second hour, we play our game, Fear and Tribbling, a Catholic trivia game show where prizes are involved. Well, today is a day. Every Friday, we pull a name out of the coffee cup of divine providence, and we proclaim God's will for at least one person anyway to receive a prize and we send them the prize free of charge praise be to god thanks to our sponsors that give us the gifts to give away and this week we had a great sponsor who is a, a leather craftsman who uh, crafted a sacred heart a leather tray that you can put in your house to put your rosaries on your holy water your blessed salt or other items, and it's actually quite nice. Uh, we, I don't know if we ever got a picture put up on our Facebook feed or our feeds, but it's it's quite nice. A little Sacred Heart image there on the tray. I want to thank Mendoza Custom Leather Sacred Heart. Uh, thank you for, for providing that. So today's the day we pull that out of the coffee cup of Divine Providence. But in this hour, praise be to God, we are going to uh, cover the news for you here in a moment. We'll have Saint of the Day, Gospel of the Day. We will also have a What's Concerning Us section coming up at 15 past the hour. Uh, there is a disturbing image. Uh, where I don't even know where this is. My guess, if I had to guess, Germany? Oh, of course, it's in Germany. They've replaced the altar in a Catholic parish with what? A pile of dirt. That's on the agenda to talk about. There's a breaking news story out of the Lepanto Institute. We'll cover a little bit of that, but we're going to have them on next week. And then, of course, uh, the pornography story uh, on the rise. It's a definite uh, problem we have to meet with great holiness. So all of that coming up in this hour, plus Charles Colomb. Good morning to you, Adrian Fonseca. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. Praise be to God. Anything planned for the weekend? Uh, that's a good question. I feel like I do, but I don't rem remember quite what I have planned for the weekend. Let me think. Saturday, um, me and my roommates, we decided that once a month we're going to have a mandatory um, like, mandatory fun. So we're going to have go mandatory out and do something. Mandatory fun. You're yeah, living so, by a rule. Yes, yes, we are. We, we're calling it uh, the uh, our old farm monastery even though it's in the middle of an apartment in the middle of the city. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. There is zero growing of there's, anything going there's on no at that growing. farm. There's also no monastery. <laughs> there's probably but, it's uh, all men. You can imagine the smells alone uh, are it's great. incredible. It's, it's, it's yeah. very desirable. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's also my cousin's birthday yesterday. Hey, happy birthday. Uh, so we're, I think we're celebrating tomorrow as well. Uh, there's a lot going on. Oh, and the TFP is in uh, the Houston area is having a talk on the Battle of Ponto really? tomorrow. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to miss well. it. So uh, lots of stuff going God. on on Saturday, but I think that's it. I don't think I'm doing anything today or Sunday. I am taking my uh, one of my sons. We're going to go hunting this weekend out in the West Texas yeah, area, Southwest Denison. Texas area. I, I Yeah, praise be to God. I really hope we'll have a great hunt. It'll be a bountiful harvest. My family loves venison meat, so we eat it up whenever we get it, and we're grateful for having it. And so we have an opportunity to go hunting out there with a very generous person allowing us to come and harvest some deer. So we're looking forward to that. It could be camping, which is one of my favorite outdoor activities is camping and hunting, so that's on our agenda this week. So it ought to be very good. We'll have to update you on that. I, You know, I showed my kids the uh, Lepanto poem last night. <laughs> my daughter, Mary Elizabeth, she said, Dad, I did not realize you could do this. <laughs> Dad, I didn't realize you liked the great no, G.K. No, mm, <clears throat> we don't mention. Okay, 
We don't mention that part. From we now on, when Joe out. talks bad about G.K. Chesterton, I'm just going to point him to I don't a, talk uh, bad a about ten, a ten minute poem that he may have read or not read <laughs> uh, from G.K. Chesterton. I don't talk anyway. I don't talk bad about him. I just have some commentary. I just have some critiques. That's all. No big deal. No big deal. He, we should get shirts to say I have opinions. <laughs> I have opinions. I think this and other obvious facts on the agenda. All right, let's pray and dive in. We have a lot to cover. We got a, a big, awesome uh, uh, gospel today as well. So lots to do. Let's jump in. We're going to be praying for your intentions, of course. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine in intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now the headlines. Axios reports Idaho plans to bill my pillow CEO Mike Lindell for election audits. Idaho Chief Deputy Secretary of State Chad Houck announced Thursday that the state plans to bill my pillow CEO Mike Lindell for the cost of auditing three counties to disprove allegations of election fraud, the Idaho statesman reported. Houck's remarks come days after the audit concluded, reporting a 0.1% margin of error across three counties. Lindell previously alleged that presidential election audit results across 44 counties were electronically manipulated to favor Biden, per the statesman. The office said that totaling the expenses and sending the bill would take at least another couple of weeks. The Hill reports Los Angeles sheriff says he will not enforce a vaccine mandate. Los Angeles Sheriff uh, Alex Villanueva said he will not force his employees to get vaccinated as required by a mandate the city council passed on Wednesday. Quote, the issue has become so politicized, unquote, Villanueva said on Thursday. He goes on to say, there are entire groups of employees that are willing to be fired and laid off rather than get vaccinated. So I don't want to be in a position to lose 5%, 10% of my workforce overnight on a vaccine mandate, unquote. The sheriff also cited the defunding effort and referred to it coupled with the vaccine mandate as, quote, the worst of two worlds, unquote. On Wednesday, the Los Angeles City Council passed an ordinance that would require customers to show proof of vaccination before entering venues such as indoor restaurants, salons, and gyms. The mandate is one of the strictest passed in the country thus far. The Daily Wire reports another Haitian migrant caravan leaving for the border in just two weeks. Quote, we are ready for war, unquote. Texas is bracing for an influx of 60,000 Haitian migrants expected this week, but another caravan of Haitians has already crossed into southern Mexico, and its leader, an American, is vowing to lead the migrants to the United States-Mexico border, leaving in just two weeks. Quote, a migrant advocate uh, in southern Mexico says a Haitian caravan will depart for the U.S. border from the Tapachula around October the 25th with or without clearance from Mexico, unquote, Border Report noted earlier this week, adding that the advocate is an American citizen who works for the nonprofit People Without Borders. Quote, Texas government and law enforcement leaders have stepped up efforts to make up for federal government's absence, and leaders spent the weekend preparing for a possible rush of more than 60,000 Haitian migrants, unquote, the Washington Examiner noted. Roll Call reports short-term debt limit increase passes Senate, heads to House. The Senate passed a temporary debt limit increasing along party lines Thursday evening, a move that would give the Treasury Department at least a couple of months before it once again bumps up against its legal borrowing cap. The 50-48 vote sent the bill to the House where that chamber will need to clear the measure before it heads to President Joe Biden. That vote, likely next week, could be tricky given GOP opposition to the short-term patch and Democrats in the chamber barely backing any longer suspension of the debt limit uh, la late last month. 
The Senate amended the House bill, which passed 219 to 200, designed to last into early December, though it may go a little longer. And those are your headline news. The saint of the day is Blessed John Adams. No, no, not the American John Adams. He, that guy was not. I like that guy. Not necessarily uh, he, g a Catholic saint. The, you know, there was election fraud allegations for that first election. Well, there you go, I'm folks. Just saying, just saying. Well, this Blessed John Adams was born in 1545 in England, and he was a Protestant minister. He was described as being an average height with dark eyes and a dark beard, and he was a convert to Catholicism. He studied at Reims, France, and was ordained in 1579 and returned to England in March of 1581 to minister to the covert Catholics. He worked in Winchester and in Hampshire and was working primarily with the poor. He was arrested for the crime of being a priest in 1584 and he was exiled in 1585. He returned soon after to resume his ministry. He was then arrested and executed for his grave, grave crime of being a priest. He died on the 8th of October, 1586, in Tyburn, London, England, and was beatified on the 22nd of November, 1987, by John Paul II. Blessed John Adams, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 11, verses 15 through 26. When Jesus had driven out a demon, some of the crowd said, By the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others, to test him, asked him for a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste, and house will fall against house. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that it is by Beelzebul that I drive out demons. If I, then, drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own people drive them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor on which he relied and distributes the spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of someone, it roams through the arid regions searching for rest, but finding none, it says, I shall return to my home from which I came. But upon returning, it finds it swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings back seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and move in and dwell there. And the last condition of that man is worse than the first, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. St. Chrysostom said, He did not answer them from the scriptures, since they gave no heed to them, explaining them away falsely, but he answers them from things of everyday occurrence. Let that sink in. The scriptures from the very people that they came to us, to, uh, to the rest of us in the world, they weren't heeding those very same passages. Um, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, very good as usual, talks about the significance of uh, Beelzebul being a sort of a derogatory term for Satan himself. So this is a slanderous claim. This is calumny that they're accusing the Lord and Savior. Can you let that sink in for a moment? St. Cyril of Alexandria says, Since then, what you say bears upon it, upon the mark of calumny. It is plain that by the Spirit of God I cast out de devils. What is he saying? Look at the accusation they level against the, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah. Could you imagine leveling those uh, accusations and then facing him in judgment? The kingdom of God is upon you. It's pretty weighty if you stop and think about it. Our behaviors, the th our attitudes, our, the things we say. We don't get away with that stuff. No one gets away with anything. Everyone will be held to an account. And it should remind us to wake up, to live in a state of grace, to beg God for mercy while mercy is available. We'll be right back. What's Concerning Us is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. 
Howdy, this is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Show. Heard Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central and 7 a.m. Eastern, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. And I'm proud to tell you that Real Estate for Life is an underwriter of Catholic Drive Time. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations, offering their clients a faith-based experience. They are online at realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. God love you. GloryAndShine.com, a generous underwriter of Catholic Drive Time. GloryAndShine.com is a Catholic family-owned company making a variety of personal care products ranging from lotions, soap bars, gift boxes, body mist, beard care, and more. At GloryAndShine.com, they state their mission is to, quote, craft every product with deep intention while holding a vision of sharing the gospel. They are good for the body, mind, and soul, unquote. God love you, GloryAndShine.com. Thank you again. The next National Men's March to End Abortion is Monday, November 15th in Baltimore. We will gather outside of a local abortion center and march to our rally point outside of the USCCB Fall Assembly. Men, it's time. Embrace Christ. Embrace His Word. And if you stand for life, oh my goodness, you'll put a smile on God's face and your blessings. Go to themensmarch.com for more information and commit to join us on November 15th in Baltimore. Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McClain. Praise be to God. Coming up at 35 past the hour, Blessed Charles of Austria is our conversation with author Charles Colomb from uh, Tumblr House. I think that Tan has published it, though, if I'm not mistaken. So we're going to have a conversation about Blessed Charles of Austria, what he tried to do against such opposition why his life of holiness uh, mattered and why he his example is one that we can take away today but also what happened to the good old days of aristocracy <laughs> they, they seem to be gone we'll talk about that coming up at 35 past the hour there are several stories in the news that i would like to jump into uh one is anytime i see a story about pornography use on the rise boy do do uh, I get sick to the stomach? I wrote a book on how to overcome pornography addiction um, because I wanted to help men fight and win the battle. Having been addicted to pornography for, uh, myself, growing up with pornography addiction, it's something I know a lot about. And having received an incredible grace from the Lord and Savior Jesus and freedom from the slavery of pornography addiction, I wanted to help many other people. So I've traveled the country and spoken on my own story and testimony. I've been on many shows and podcasts, and I, I produced an entire documentary film where I detail that journey quite a bit. But by, by the way, you can watch that at livinghislife.net for free. Um, and it still, it amazes me how many people, how much of humanity gives themselves over to pornography in all of its many shades. And so there was an article out that here on RT, not something, I, I don't really go to RT all that often, but because they're the only ones covering the story, well, there you go. Uh, the headline goes, never down. Pornhub says traffic surged by millions of active users during Facebook outage. One of the world's most visited websites, Pornhub. Did you get that? One of the world's most visited websites is Pornhub. That, is, that, that should be very telling about the state of affairs this world really is in. One of the world's most visited websites, Pornhub, became even more popular this week, its data analyst shows. With Instagram and Facebook inaccessible, Internet users entertain themselves online with adult-only content. Pornhub detected an increase in traffic on Monday when Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp were all down for some six hours in a major worldwide outage. During this quiet time, quote, about half a million additional users during each hour, unquote, flocked to the website offering adult content Pornhub revealed by publishing its October 4 average hourly traffic. It is uh, very concerning. You know, why am I even pointing this out? I mean, like Captain Obvious, right? In 2020, with the lockdowns that were supposed to, you know, 15 days to uh, flatten the curve. Remember that? Remember the good old days of 15 days to flatten the curve? Golly gee whiz, those were the days, weren't they? Well, when that lockdown went into month after month, 
pornography surged. So a lot of stuff surged during that time. Suicides, depression, addictions, uh, abuse of family members at the home, and pornography is definitely among those. The untold cost uh, on people, you know, we talk about the pandemic, we, we sometimes forget about the costs that are associated with our solutions to this problem. When it comes to pornography, it gets a pass in many, in many circles. When I published my book in 2014, uh, I tried to pay to advertise my book, thinking it would be a helpful resource to men in particular who wanted, it, wanted freedom. I was trying to advertise specifically to Catholic men, family men who wanted freedom from pornography. And Facebook called me, uh, they blocked my ads, and they told me that I was, um, I was not welcome to promote my book because it was judgmental, because I was a, 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 a <laughs> there's a lot of terms I can't use. Let that sink in. The cost on souls who give themselves to these mortal sins, who allow their minds to devolve into the muck and the mire. One of the, the problems with pornography is you, you fail to think correctly because your brain, the neuroplasticity of the brain creates these pathways. Well, when you, are, when you allow yourself to, uh, to engage in this material, your brain begins to create pathways to all the wrong sections. And then what happens is you stop thinking clearly about the dignity of the human person. And you can start to rationalize choices that are terrible. And one sin can lead to another sin. The price of sin is the sin itself, as Dr. Hahn would love to say. And uh, how many people in our midst, our family, our friends, our communities, are heavily engaged and think it's completely okay to enjoy, quote unquote, pornography. Souls will end up in hell if we don't take more action. It is our opportunity, it is our time to have a, you know, I, I was just thinking the other day about St. Augustine, his book, The City of God, volume one. He, he was lamenting over the Romans who were in North Africa, having left Rome after the fall of the city being sacked by vandal after vandal, goth after goth, wave after wave of the barbarians coming in, sacking, pillaging, raping, and enslaving. Woe is me, they would say. And Augustine said, well, hold on, wait up, time out. Um, did you think that God's judgment would just keep you nice and safe and cozy? When you stood around watching the debauchery of your community, you did nothing. It was, your, it was on your watch that these things happened. So, yes, these judgments, these chastisements will affect both the good and the bad, so to speak. I think about that a lot. I think about that a lot. There are souls who are facing the eternal damnation because of these mortal sins. And we, you and I, we have an opportunity to do something about that. It, it disturbs me to see that if we can't find other, quote, wholesome, unquote, inter entertainments like, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, um, tongue in cheek as I say it, that we're going to switch to pornography. Let us reach out. Despite, in spite of the law and the times we live in, we have opportunities to reach out to people who are in these circumstances and do something about it. Share a book with them. It doesn't have to be mine. I mean, there are people who do it way better than I do. Send those books to these people. Just do something. Reach out. Pray for them. Offer up sacrifices. Do what you can. But this is a very, very concerning story. Um, pornography. It's horrible. Let's turn to another story that's very disturbing to me. There is, uh, in, in Germany, a parish, apparently, that has replaced its altar with a pile of sand or, or dirt. Adrian, what is going on here? Yes, I would. Is, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of funny if it wasn't so sacrilegious and blasphemous to God. Um, 
other than that, it was, you know, it's hilarious. But the, um, the what happened here was a church in Germany. I can't, I don't, can't say your German words, but they're calling yeah. it der Ard, der Ard, Erdlings, which means earthlings of the earth. And Earth, earthlings <laughs> of the earth. It's very redundant. Right. I'm sure it means it's probably more profound in uh, German. I'm, I'm assuming. I have no idea. But the, here's the problem. They got. They had a literal pile of dirt. So I watched the whole video of them setting up the altar. Yeah. And I say altar in quotes because I got the video. Like, is, you want to share my screen? Yeah. It, it's quite. It's quite horrific, to be honest. It's uh, what happens here is the what they they literally come in with a pile of dirt and they just start unloading dirt in the middle of the church. Now, you're not even supposed to bring like food into the church. You're going to you're making a mess whenever you do that. See, right now if you're watching if you're watching on YouTube or on social media feeds, if you're listening on the radio, you can't see this, but what's happening is they literally stuck a pile of dirt in the middle of the sanctuary. Then they have people shovel out a hollow hollow out to the dirt and they made an altar like not really an altar. They made an, a we talked about this yesterday in the game show, the mensa of the church, the of uh, the altar, the uh, is the actual table. And that is supposed to be out of stone. And now, if you cannot have a stone altar, that's whenever you're, it's permissible to have a wooden altar or another suitable material. Dirt is not a suitable material for the sacrifice of mass. Why is it not? Because the sacrifice of the mass will acquire something with permanence, with gravitas, which is why typically you know, marble is used. Right. And I think there's an exception for missionary exactly. country, missionary territory. You can use wood, which... Is America? I'm curious. Is America Te still a missionary territory? Technically speaking, the U.S. is technically still missionary territory. Still missionary territory. And so we because we have, have a lot altars. of wooden altars here. Uh, but typically, especially in Europe and Germany, these were uh, this is. And the other thing is, it's not like they are in need of a portable altar or something. They're in a church, established church. Why? Why do you figure Germany is so anxious to do things like this? Well, what, what, what is driving Germany to desperately want to experiment, to be so novel, to be so, I don't even know how, I mean, of course you could throw the word out there, modern. Yeah, sure. I mean, there is that, but I think it's even worse than that, to be honest. They're, I think so, too. So, it's like we reject everything of tradition mm -hmm. so much that we even throw out the altar. Well, the, here's one thing that I find incredible. Like, this is look at where people important. are sitting in this video. The, so if you're listening on radio, you can't see this, but people are sitting in chairs all throughout the building, not like in pews. They're spread everywhere, up against the walls, back behind where the altar would be, up front in circles. I mean, it's just like so random and everywhere. And they're right now they're carving out of this giant pile of dirt where the altar used to be. They're carving an area for the priest to stand and then a right. flat surface on top to obviously uh, prepare for Holy Mass. And here's one of the worst parts is that it does not, I watched to where they set it up and they set up the actual altar part of it. They do not have an altar stone. Instead, they put like plastic over it and then they put the altar cloth over it and then they had mass said there. You have to have an altar stone. Even in portable altars, they give you an altar stone with relics of the saint there because that is required for the mass to be said in that manner. And they did not do that. And it's, it's an entirely new theology that's being put here. And the lex orandi of the faith, the law of prayer of the faith is a law of belief. And so that's what I think the origin of this problem is. It's these small errors that you keep adding little changes to the liturgy, little changes to things. And it slowly eats at your faith until your, your faith is just whatever you want it to be. Then you have to be faithful to the Lex Orandi of the church, the law of prayer. We have to be faithful. That's the reason why St. Charles Borromeo wrote a three-volume book set on how churches, altars, and things like that should be built and should be structured because it's that important. The rubrics there are not just to be rigid, just to be mean. They're there because they are there to defend our faith, to protect our faith, and to point us toward true faith. All the symbols and signs, these are theologies that are being imbued in us, even if we're not aware of it. And that's incredibly important for us to keep in mind and this is what's the error of right, what's going on in this situation where is the bishop where is the bishop on this issue it is mind boggling pray for the church especially in germany i mean college you is if they're not headed for a schism i don't know what is i don't pray for that i don't want that i pray for the opposite i want unity let's pray for unity by the way we have a great story coming up next hour about unity a saint being declared a doctor. We're all
also have Michael Hinchborn on next week. He's got a breaking story. But coming up after this short break, coming up next. 1 John 2.27 reads, You have no need that anyone should teach you, as his anointing, the Holy Spirit that is, teaches you about everything. Sounds pretty Protestant, doesn't it? No living teaching authority and just me and the Holy Spirit? Was John Protestant? Absolutely not. And here are some reasons why. First, John can't be rejecting a living teaching authority because in 1 John 4, 6, he instructs his readers that the apostles' teaching is the criterion for discerning truth from error. So what does John mean? He's warning his readers against false teachers. In 1 John 2, 19, he writes, Some went out from us, but they were not of us. If false teachers, well, then there must be true teachers. Sure, the Spirit teaches Christians the truth, but he does so through the living teaching authority, not apart from it. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Howdy, this is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Show. Heard Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central and 7 a.m. Eastern, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. And I'm proud to tell you that Real Estate for Life is an underwriter of Catholic Drive Time. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations, offering their clients a faith-based experience. They are online at realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. God love you. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. The Financial Post reported Tesla moving headquarters to Texas from California. Texas CEO Elon Musk said on Thursday the electric car maker plans to move its headquarters from Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas, where it is building a massive car and battery complex. Tesla joins Oracle, HP, Toyota Motor, and others in moving to U.S. headquarters in Texas from California, which has relatively high taxes and living costs. While Silicon Valley also is a hive of development of new ideas and companies, Texas is known for cheaper labor, less stringent regulations, or I like to say freedom. Uh, billionaire Elon Musk himself moved to the Lone Star State from California in December to focus on the electric car maker's new plant, as well as his SpaceX rocket company, which he has a launch site on the tip of southern Texas. Jerusalem Post reports Palestinians outraged over a court ruling allowing Jewish prayer on Temple Mount. Palestinians expressed outrage and warned of an escalation on Thursday after a court ruling on Wednesday implied support for allowing quiet prayer by Jewish visitors on the Temple Mount, the first such official recognition of practice uh, which has gone undisturbed for the past year and a half. On Wednesday, the Jerusalem magistrate heard the appeal of a Mr. Lippo, a Jewish visitor to the Temple Mount, who had been removed and distanced from the complex for 15 days after a police officer ordered him to stop praying during a visit on Yom Kippur. After watching and rec the recording of the incident, Justice uh, Yaholom ruled that the appellate's behavior did not violate the law or police instructions on the Temple Mount as he was praying without a crowd and quietly in a way that was not external or visible. Epic Times reports Biden urges more employers to issue vaccine mandates ahead of the OSHA rule. President Joe Biden is asking private businesses to implement COVID-19 vaccine mandates ahead of the rollout of his federal rule requiring many to do so. President, uh, the President Biden traveled to Illinois on Thursday to tour a Clayco construction site in Elk Grove Village in Illinois and to give a speech, quote, I'm calling on more employers to act, unquote, Biden said in his address, going on to say, my, uh, my message is to require your employers to get vaccinated. The speech also included Biden's familiar refrain, quote, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, unquote. Uh, United Airlines said last week that it's set to terminate 593 of its employees who have chosen not to comply with the company's vaccine mandate. Biden downplayed that number Thursday, touting the company's vaccination rate, which went from 59 percent to 99 percent after United put its mandate in place. It makes it kind of easy when you fire everybody, I guess. Yeah, Biden says, quote, when you see headlines and reports of mass firings and hundreds of people losing their jobs, 
Look at the bigger story, unquote, said President Biden. LifeSite News reports dystopian USA. New York Times readers react to Biden's order to report $600 bank transactions. Thousands of New York Times readers reacted with panic and shock to the paper's report that President Biden's administration proposes requiring banks to report information on customers' transactions of $600 or more to the IRS. More than 3,000 people uh, commenting on the Times' report on, and their Facebook post were critical of the Biden administration, the Daily Caller reported. On Tuesday, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen defended the proposal, assuring Americans in a CNBC interview that, quote, collection of information is routine, unquote. Yellen said that the measure will help fill the estimated shortfall of $7 trillion over the next 10 years to what is owed. The gap, she said, comes largely from, quote, places where the information on income is opaque and can be hidden, unquote. A Times reader observed that the $600 threshold probably covers most of the people in the United States. And those are your headline news. Praise be to God in all things. Joining us now via Zoom chat uh, is uh, Charles Colomb uh, to talk about his book, Blessed Charles of Austria. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Praise be to God. I am alive. And that counts. And that counts. And uh, for more than a little. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We live in interesting times, to say the least. But, you know, it's, what's interesting about uh, what we're going to talk to you about is uh, I don't I didn't know a lot about Blessed Charles of Austria until you wrote the book last year. You published it last year. And, and then there were talks and, and there was a lot of conversation about it. Up until then, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to this person. And he lived in truly interesting times as well. Can you start by telling us who he is and why he matters, not just from a, a faith perspective? but from a history perspective as well? Well, the short, uh, the short way to answer that question is that he was the last emperor of Austria-Hungary. Now, that, what does that mean? Well, it means he was the inheritor of, on one level, 800 and on another, uh, a lot longer tradition of Catholic governing, of, uh, of Catholic leadership, lay leadership specifically. Uh, obviously, in all that time, there were there were good and bad, better and worse figures, but he epitomized all that was best in them. Uh, he he inherited his country's participation in World War One when he became uh, the emperor. The war had been uh, going for two years. You may remember that it started because his uncle, the then heir to the throne, was assassinated in Sarajevo. Well. He um, was presented with two major problems on two different fronts. One was the war itself, which he wanted ended as soon as possible. Unfortunately, a desire that was not shared by many, many other leaders on either side. Uh, and usually his, his attempts uh, at peace would be favored by one side or the other only when they were losing. Mm. And then as soon as they seemed to get an advantage, they'd be against it. Um, the uh, the other problem he faced with was a uh, more equitable reorganization of his country, which was a problem that, again, he inherited. And he had some bright ideas to deal with it. But unfortunately, thanks to the war, he never got the chance to really put them into practice. But against that terrible background, uh, he lived the faith. And he was a, a great family man, a great father. Uh, both in public and private life, he lived the faith and did so facing innumerable challenges, not just while he was ruling his country, but after it collapsed, after the end of the war. Uh, twice he attempted to regain the throne of Hungary, uh, but his redoubtable wife stuck by him uh, in all of, all of that. And all the while, they continued to have a family life. Uh, he ended up dying very tragically, uh, partly, I'm sorry to say, due to the intransigence of his former foes, the mm. uh, British, French, and Americans. He uh, died on the island of Madeira of uh, pneumonia uh, in 1922 at the age of 30. Now I've gone blank, but he was in his early 30s. Wow. He's young. He was very young. And 
a real example in in everything he did. Uh, another another thing that up until I wrote the book, I really hadn't thought about, but he was also a uh, a supremely good example for the products of broken homes and difficult families. Mm. His own parents were very badly matched, and uh, you know his father died of syphilis. So I mean, it, oh, wow. it was yeah he he came something. from a yeah, he came from a very difficult background. But what was interesting is that not only did he stay on good terms with both of his parents, despite their, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, displeasure with each other, he got the best out of each of them. Mm. So, so from his mother, he got her very deep piety, her, her seriousness of purpose, without her dour manner. And then from his father, he got his charm, his easy way of doing things, his way of, well, charm is, I guess, really what sums it up, his sense of humor and everything, but not his promiscuity. And if you think about it, every individual who comes from a, a background like that is, that's the best they could possibly do. Yeah. We're talking with uh, Charles Cologne. We only have about a minute or so, but we have to go to our break. We're talking about his book, Blessed Charles of Austria, uh, published by Tan. You can find it over at the Tumblr house, by the way, tumblrhouse.com. Why Charles? Why not Carl? Well, they're interchangeable, uh, really. And it was almost a flip of the coin because even in English, he's called Carl a lot. Mm. Uh, but Charles is the English, and so that's what we ended up settling on. Um you you got a lot of a lot of problems like that. Although his uh, his great uncle, who was the emperor before him, everybody calls Franz Joseph. Very very rarely will you see him referred to as Francis Joseph. Oh wow! Um, I want to talk about. We're gonna have to uh, put a pin in it because of the break. But we'll come back and we'll we'll pick it back up. But I want to talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, so much in modern thought and history. We talk about uh, the uh, the oppressive nature of kingdoms and kings and and rulers and all of that, and yet uh, we have uh, seemingly embraced the idea of a world without uh, aristocracy and why there might be a Catholic argument to make aristocracy great again. And uh, could the blessed Charles of Austria be someone to look at as a model for that? I want to talk about that, but I'm also fascinated because yesterday the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Pope Pius the, the fifth desperately trying to bring the Holy League together. Uh, France, the do eldest daughter of the church, no thank you. Uh, England, of course, went into a, a schism and uh, they weren't coming to the rescue. So Christians against Christians against the Turks. Uh, maybe he struggled with a little bit of that, too. So we'll talk about that with Charles Colomb coming up right after this break. Don't go anywhere. Tell a friend. Got to drive that. We'll be right back. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever noticed that the world associates fanaticism with religion? But G.K. Chesterton says that the strangest fanaticism that fills our time is the fanatical hatred of morality, especially of Christian morality. It is the irreligious who are fanatical in their hatred of religion. They hate religion because religion is the only basis for morality. They hate morality because it is clear. And they prefer things to be vague, vague to the point where they can call wrongs rights. But we cannot call something a right when it defies God's laws. We can only call it a sin because all rights come from God and God is not going to break his own laws. Neither should we. Want more than a minute? Visit our website, chesterton.org. Howdy, this is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Show. Heard Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central and 7 a.m. Eastern, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. And I'm proud to tell you that Real Estate for Life is an underwriter of Catholic Drive Time. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations, offering their clients a faith-based experience. They are online at realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. God love you. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Charles Colomb is our guest. TumblrHouse.com is the website. The book is called Blessed Charles of Austria. 
It is published by Tan. Good, good morning to you again, sir. Thank you again for being on with us. We're very grateful. Um, let's talk about the, the the political situation in Europe uh, for these rulers. Uh, I mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday was our feast day of Our Lady of Victory. And uh, the difficulty to bring the Holy League together to stem the tide of the uh, Ottoman Empire, the, the Saracens, you know, invading Europe and, and slaughtering and pillaging and all the rest. The French would not come to the rescue. There were many others. D was that still the remnants of what Blessed Charles was dealing with? Well, in in a sense, I, I mean to say, in uh, France, of course, at the time of Lepanto, was on the verge of a civil war. Mm. And they um, they were busy with their own issues. Even if they hadn't been, uh, there was an unfortunate, starting in the, um, about 20 years earlier, there was an unfortunate uh, break between the Habsburgs and the, uh, the French that would last a good 200 years, sadly, mm. and was in itself responsible for all sorts of problems later on. Um, by the time of World War I, France had, of course, overthrown their own monarchy several times yeah. and ended up at the time with a very anti-clerical republic, which had oppressed the church horribly in the 10 years prior to the outbreak of World War I. Uh, the French government only let up on its suppression of the church when they realized they needed Catholics to die in the trenches. You see. Uh, governments tend to be more friendly to the church when they need to use Catholics. It's funny how that works. I, I don't know why, it's just the way it is. But uh, seriously, he, um, he did inherit, though, a problem. His wife was, oddly enough, Zita. She was a Bourbon princess, of herself of French descent. He was actually very pro-French. Mm. And his two brothers-in-law, who were the ones, his, media, his uh, mediators, you might say, his uh, messengers in terms of trying to seek peace with the Allies, they had initially, in 1914, although they were very close to him, they had tried to serve in the French army. But because they were members of the old royal family, they were forced to serve in the Belgian army instead. So uh, it was the same, but it was different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but it, one of the results of that, uh, of the failed attempts to make peace with the French was becoming acquainted with Aristide Briand, who at the time was the foreign minister, and then later when he would try to retake the Hungarian throne, was the French prime minister. And he became very pro Karl mm. because he got to know him. You know, he got to know him as a, uh, a lover of peace. And it's, it's really extremely unfortunate, shall we say, to say the least, that when you had men like that, they were constantly frustrated by people who thought they knew better. Mm. Uh, with 2020 hindsight, we know they didn't. I mean, at the end of the day, and I'm very sad to have to say this, the, there were a number of, shall we say, nemesis, uh, evil figures in Charles's story. But probably the worst was our own president, Woodrow Wilson. Wow. Really? Wow. Yeah. He, um, he was absolutely determined that the, uh, the Habsburgs and their monarchy would be destroyed. And the same for the Hohenzollerns. But as, would, as uh, Winston Churchill, who no one can accuse of being uh, too pro-German or, uh, or pro-Austrian. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you could accuse him of that all you like, but good, I wouldn't. Good luck. Uh, yeah. he, uh, he said that it was the American insistence on getting rid of the Habsburgs and the Hohenzollerns and all the rest of them that uh, paved the way for Hitler. Well, see, that brings a, a great point that I wanted to ask about um, was in regards to Charles of Austria in America. Why is it that there's a rising devotion to Charles of Austria in the U.S., especially whenever U.S. has traditionally been very anti-monarchy? We have a lot of uh, Protestantism, Americanism built into us where we are very anti-monarchy. We get taught in schools that, you know, it's a good thing we, we shrugged off the shackles of mm. the British monarchy and uh, that kind of thing. We, we love our presidents. We love our, our democracy, our republic. And uh, wh how on earth did the, a devotion to a king in the U.S. happen? And what's the importance of that? 
Well, I think part of the problem, you know, my, my, one of my little jokes is that uh, the United States are the world's longest and most successful Oedipus complex. <laughs> uh, you know, we got rid of daddy back in 1783 and we've never mm. quite recovered. But the, uh, the truth is, and, and again, we're, as you say, we're fed this stuff from the, be from the beginning. We don't notice that no monarchy that pretended to be Christian, not even that of Henry VIII, has dared to do what our free governments do. You know, redefine marriage, redefine what a human being is. Uh, even Henry VIII had to pretend to go by the law. <laughs> Whereas we just rewrite it, you know. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. Like many of the bad popes in in our history, they didn't bother to uh, to try to justify their crimes. They just did them. They just did them. But with us, we we justify. We change the law. Yeah. You see, and 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 we're wonderful, as we know. Uh, and I think part of the reason for his popularity is that we're aware of that on a deep level. We know there's something deeply wrong with the way we're doing things. If you don't believe me, put on your mask, go home, and make sure you get your uh, $600 bank transaction looked at. Right. Exactly. Uh, you know, otherwise, how, how will you know if you're safe? Right. Right. But, exactly. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, that's part of it. Another part of it is that he represents a sort of leadership that we're not familiar with, the sacrificial leadership. I mean, we're very much familiar with leaders who don't mind sending us to die for them. What is not so used to us is the idea of a leader who would die for us. Mm. And that, of course, part of, part of Christian kingship is the willingness to die for your people. Well, that doesn't mean they were all perfect. Let's What's let's, let's talk, I want to jump into that real quick. We have about I don't know six minutes, five minutes maybe left in our conversation. Uh, it, you know, to the point of. Catholics, especially in America, um, don't have a sense of, of uh, aristocracy. We don't have a sense of, of what it means to have a, a true and good king. Uh, no. We don't have any examples in our history or our life to, to really fall back upon. Maybe there are those in Europe who do and can see it from a different light than we do. So is it possible? Have we thrown the baby out with the bathwater here? Should we, uh, should we want a, a good uh, holy, righteous aristocracy again? Well, it depends on what you want ruling you. You know, I mean, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, I would rather be, be ruled by someone who thinks that if he doesn't rule me well, although he may be, his idea of what's ruling me well is maybe uh, not true, but I would rather be ruled by someone who thinks that if he rules me badly, he'll go to hell. Mm. Then be ruled by someone who sees me as, a, as an economic cow to be milked, wow. or if necessary, to be sent purely to the slaughter. Um, I mean, what do you want to be ruled by? Do you want to be ruled by scum, or do you want to be ruled by someone you can look up to? It really isn't that difficult. Yes, but I guess the argument would be I would want to be ruled by somebody who's holy, but that holy person doesn't necessarily need to be a king or a queen, or do they? Well, let's just say, abstractly, nothing needs to be anything. Mm. But in terms of historical reality, in terms of what we've actually seen, you're likely to get it under a Catholic monarch. Yeah, I say likely because you find lots of exceptions. But you'll also find a lot of canonized Catholic uh, uh, saints and blesseds amongst the, uh, the Catholic royalty of Europe. And so, we, we have about uh, two, three minutes left. Uh, before you finish that thought, uh, I wanted to add on to that real quick, because I heard that Blessed Car of Austria had a great devotion to the Sacred Heart, and I'm assuming that's probably related to, hey, you said that he admired the French, Margaret Mary Alaco, I'm thinking of her. Um, could you speak about that in relation to what Joe was just talking about? I, I certainly could. Um, the Sacred Heart was, in fact, a huge part of his devotion. Also, you should remember that every royal house, every Catholic royal house in Europe, had a particular kind of devotion that was special to them, a style of devotion, as you might say. Uh, with the French, it was the Religion Royale, it was called, the, for the Bourbon. With the Habsburgs, it was called the Pietas Austriaca, the Austrian piety. So the Blessed Sacrament, the Sacred Heart, Our Lady, the Passion, uh, the Holy Cross, these were huge 
in their lives. Now, that, again, that doesn't mean all the Habsburgs were pious. Uh, <laughs> Carl's own father, uh, as an example. But even Carl's own father, as a boy, had been enrolled as what was called a child of Mary. Mm. And he remembered this on his deathbed. And I, and I say remembered it on his deathbed, I mean, I'm being very literal. If nothing else, they always had something to go back to. Uh, and with with Carl, he made the consecration of the Sacred Heart uh, several times. Wow. He, uh, both as a family, him personally, his family, and then, of course, uh, he had the bishops consecrate Austria-Hungary to the Sacred Heart. Praise be to God. That is amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, it's the kind of thing that happened we're not aware of. Uh, Alfonso of Spain consecrated in, uh, in 1928, I think, consecrated Spain to the Sacred Heart. Uh, and this is something, the whole idea of national consecrations is a little beyond us. Or if we have them, it's strictly the bishops. Yeah. The idea of the head of state doing it. it is amazing. That much yeah. would be pretty pretty cool. Praise be to God. But we're just about out of time. The book is called Blessed Charles of Austria. It's published by Tan. You can also find it right at uh, tumblerhouse.com. That's tumblerhouse.com. Charles Colomb, thank you for your time today. We're very grateful. We'd love to have you back and uh, maybe continue a conversation about making aristocracy great again or Catholic again. That would be amazing. Praise God. God bless you. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Bye-bye. All right, that is going to do it for hour number one of uh, Catholic Drive Time. Thank you for joining us for that. Praise God. If you can join us in the next hour, we would love to have you. We're going to have uh, more stories and news to cover, plus the game show segment and prizes. Today is the day we give out the prizes, and you could win. You want to get your last three chances in? Uh, well, you got to call at the right time. I'll give you all the details in the next hour. If you want to join us online, watch live, listen live, go to grnonline.com forward slash C. DT. That's grnonline.com forward slash cdt. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you back on Monday, 6 a.m. Central. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. some friends who are Catholic who say that you don't have to believe everything that the church teaches, whether it's in the catechism or not. Is that true? No, it's not true. If you want to call yourself Catholic, but you want to pick and choose for yourself which of the church's teachings to accept and which to reject, you give everyone else who calls himself Catholic the right to do the same thing. For example, you believe women should be priests. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1577, it states, only a baptized man validly receives ordination. For this reason, the ordination of women is not possible. You don't believe that. Well, that's fine. I just made this a catechism of your Catholic Church, but not mine. But remember, if you can throw doctrines out, so can everyone else who calls himself Catholic. That gives Joe Parishioner over at St. Doubting Thomas Catholic Church the right to throw out the church's social justice teachings. He doesn't feel like feeding the hungry, caring for the poor, and all that other bleeding heart stuff. Paragraphs 2401 to 2463. I just made this a catechism of his Catholic Church, but not mine. You believe contraception is okay. Paragraph 2370 says contraception is intrinsically evil. Joe Parishioner doesn't like what the church teaches on the death penalty. Paragraphs 2364 to 65. You don't like what it teaches on these pages, pages 505 to 508. He doesn't like what it teaches on these other pages here, pages 610 to 615. Can you see what's happening? I heard it said once that there is a shortage of vocations to the priesthood in the United States, but no shortage of vocations to the papacy. If we don't believe in all of it, if we each appoint ourselves pope and throw out a doctrine here or a doctrine there, then our faith is no longer Catholic. A beacon of truth in a troubled world. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul.
Howdy, this is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Show. Heard Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central and 7 a.m. Eastern, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. And I'm proud to tell you that Real Estate for Life is an underwriter of Catholic Drive Time. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations, offering their clients a faith-based experience. They are online at realestateforlife.org. That's realestateforlife.org. God love you. Welcome to your Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. We love God. We ought to be able to talk about Him. Getting you started on your day. With the latest in breaking news and information from the Vatican to the White House and everything in between. It's serious. It's fun. It's your Catholic Drive Time. Now, here's your host, Joe McClain. Jesus Christ, welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Good morning. It's uh, Friday. You have survived it. Congratulations. You made it through the week. Praise be to God. What are you going to do this weekend? I'm, I'm very curious. What is on your plans? Is it the honeydew list? Is it, uh, I don't know. I mean, are you going to go on a trip? Are you guys going to do something fun? I'm just be curious. You could always hang out with us in the after show coming up in 30 minutes from now and tell us what you're going to do. We would love to chat with you. And uh, by the way, today is uh, Emily Alcaraz's birthday. She was our very first co-host on the program. And uh, today is her birthday. So happy birthday to you, Emily. I hope you're going to have some fun today in the windy city of Chicago. Um, but uh, today on the program, we're going to cover a good news story, praise be to God, and then we will dive into the saint of the day, the gospel of the day, and then uh, we'll play our game, Fear and Trembling, with the last three opportunities to get into the prize pack for today, because today is the day where we pull a name out of the hat. Let's just, can we just stop and pray for the phone system to work appropriately so we get the call earlier? Uh, speaking of broken things, Adrian Fonseca is here on the ones and twos. Good morning, amen, Adrian. Amen. Good morning my friend. Good it is morning. good to be here. It is, is it? good to be here. It's funny is you it? mentioned Emily's birthday because I literally had just texted her <laughs> and she had just responded. I told her, texted her happy birthday and she's like, thank you. So I, I think it's hilarious that you mentioned that. Yeah, praise, so, be, to praise God. be to God. That's her birthday. And uh, you are going camping this weekend. I heard you're hiking 26 miles, no. 1,800 feet of eva- no. elevation. That's pretty amazing, Joe. No, not every hunting, camping, hiking trip is as extreme as yours. Good grief. See, I've only ever been on one, and now my <laughs> in my image of all hiking trips yeah. is that one. Your standard is now very high. Yes. 26 miles, 1,800 uh, feet, feet in elevation. elevation, which is, you know, if you're if you're like in Colorado or whatever, that's not a lot. Okay, that's not a lot. But, but if you're in Texas. It's a lot. Or Arkansas <laughs> in your case. Yeah, in Arkansas in my but case. I would even add a further dimension to that. Your bar is too high when you have outdoor mass and confession. Yeah. Along with your hike and, and all that, your bar is very high. I guarantee you most trips aren't going to be quite like well, that. Well, in that case, maybe I won't swear off hiking then. <laughs> yes. Because I'm like, if every trip is like this, I think I might wait a decade before going back. <laughs> a decade. No, it's fun. I love that stuff. It's, it's, quite, it's quite exhilarating. I love being outdoors. Speaking of which, Janice is here. Good morning to you, Janice. Good morning, Joe. Praise be to God. How are the outdoors? I love the outdoors. Yeah. They're, um, yeah, I, I find a lot of peace at being outside in the nature. I I love, if I could live next to the woods and next to a hiking trail and a lake and a stream, yeah, that would be the dream for sure. I love that. Praise be to God. Well, uh, you know, we don't always get to go outside, but when we do, we love it a lot. And I don't dream of it. This weekend, I can't (laughs) wait to be outside hunting and camping with one of my sons and, one of the things I really look forward to, one of my favorite parts of, of doing that is usually the star field. Ooh, I am a sucker for a great star field. And if you can see the Milky Way, oh, it's the best ever. So I'm hoping and praying. Where, where are you guys hiking to? We are going to go camp and, and hunt this weekend in uh, southwest Texas. So just on the other side of San Antonio. And okay. uh, we've been out there a bunch of times, and usually the star field is quite nice. But usually it's we're there when it's super cold. So that's it'll, awesome. It'll be I feel different. like ever, since I've been on the radio with you with you guys, I feel like you've gone hiking every other weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to get out there as much as I possibly can. Anyway, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, praise God. All right, so we're gonna jump into it. Don't forget the game show is coming up. If you want the phone number to call in earlier, well. Play, praise God, we would take you. Just go to the website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. By the way, I sent 
I sent the interview with Henry Sear on the apostolic visitations of religious communities. I sent the entire interview, I think it was like 50 minutes, to the CDT Insider email list. If you want to get that before next week, then you need to join that email list. Go to our website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT, and you, I think I'll, I think it'll hit your inbox on Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. And then next week, we'll play a portion of it. So the entire thing will be available now to our CDT insiders, and a portion of it will be played on the radio next week. All right, praise God. Let's jump in. Let's pray and get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now some good news. In the last hour, we cover the headlines. So we do two uh, headline news segments in the first hour. So you can go back and watch those if you want the latest of the headline news. But we like to do something a little bit more upbeat in this second hour. And here's a story out of the National Catholic Register. Pope Francis to declare St. Irenaeus a doctor of the church with the title of Doctor of Unity. The uh, article goes on to say, Pope Francis, um, Pope Francis said on Thursday that he plans to declare Saint Irenaeus of Leon a doctor of the church with the title of Doctor Unitatis, meaning Doctor of Unity. The Pope made the announcement in a speech to the uh, Saint Irenaeus Working Group, a group of Catholic and Orthodox theologians who conducted a study together on synodality and primacy. Quote, your patron, Saint Irenaeus of Leon, whom soon I will willingly declare a doctor of the church with the title of Doctor Unitatis, came from the East, exercised his Episcopal ministry in the West, and was a great spiritual and theological bridge between Eastern and Western Christians, unquote, Pope Francis said yesterday. St. Irenaeus was a second century bishop and writer revered by both Catholics and Orthodox Christians and known for refuting the heresies of Gnosticism with a defense of both Christ's humanity and divinity. The U.S. bishops voted last year in favor of having St. Irenaeus named a doctor of the church at the request of Cardinal Philip Barbarian, the uh, Archbishop of Leon, I'm pro- did I say his name correctly? I think I just uh, obliterated his poor name. Cardinal Felipe Barberin, probably is how you say that. Barberin, Cardinal Barberin, the Archbishop of Leon, Southern France, and sent their approval to the Vatican for the Pope's consideration. Quote, his name, Irenaeus, contains the word peace, unquote, Pope Francis said. He goes on to say, quote, we know that the Lord's peace is not negotiated peace, the fruit of agreements meant to safeguard interests, but a peace that reconciles, that bridges together in unity, that is, the peace of Jesus. The Pope spoke about synodality and primacy during the meeting with the with St. Irenaeus Working Group, a joint Orthodox Catholic Working Group from the Institute from Ecumenical Studies at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in Rome. Quote, a fruitful approach to primacy in theological and ecumenical dialogue must necessarily be grounded in a reflection on synodality. There is no other way. Unquote, Pope Francis said. He says, I have frequently expressed my conviction that in a synodal church, greater light can be shed on the exercise of the Petrine primacy. And those, that is your good news for today. The saint of the day is kind of a uh, odd saying. You might recognize his name. His blessed John Adams. No, no. Founding father not, of the country. Not yes. one of the founding fathers. Not President John Adams. He converted? I didn't know. Not at all. That's it amazing. is a, a John Adams from 1545, oh. born in England, and was a Protestant minister. And I believe uh, John Adams, the president, was a Unitarian. Yes. He 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 was described as being, I'm going back, this is blessed John Adams now, uh, <laughs> is described as being of average height with dark eyes and a dark beard. He converted to Catholicism, and he studied at Reims, France and was ordained in 1579. He returned to England in March of 1581 to minister to covert Catholics. He worked in Winchester and Hampshire and working primarily with the poor. 
He was arrested for the crime of being a priest in 1584. He was exiled in 1585, and like any good priest, he returned soon after to resume his ministry. He was then arrested and executed for the grave, grave crime of being a priest. He died on the October of the 8th of October 1586 in Tyburn, London, England and was beatified on the 22nd of November 1987 by John Paul II. Blessed John Adams, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 11 verses 15 through 26. When Jesus had driven out a demon, some of the crowd said, by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others, to test him, asked him for a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste, and house will fall against house. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that it is by Beelzebul that I drive out demons. If I... Then drive out demons by Beelzebul. By whom do your own people drive them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But, but if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor on which he relied and distributes the spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of someone, it roams through arid regions searching for rest, but finding none, it says, I shall return to my home from which I came. But upon returning, it finds it swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings back seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, who move in and dwell there. And the last condition of that man is worse than the first, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is upon you. Just imagine hearing Jesus, looking him in the eye as he says those most powerful words. The feeling that, that, that must have been in the hearts of these very same people that were accusing him of, con of conspiring with the devil. Think about that. Accusing God himself of a sp a conspiring with the devil. That is pretty profound. Here's what Ambrose said, though. Uh, the comparison, then, is between one man and the whole Jewish people, from whom, through the law, the unclean spirit had been cast out. But because in the Gentiles, who har whose hearts were first barren, but afterwards, in baptism, moistened with the dew of the Spirit, the devil could not find rest because of their faith in Christ. For to the unclean spirits, Christ is a flaming fire. He then returned to the Jewish people." Unquote. Adrian, what did you find? Oh, this is great. Cornelius Lapide had a lot to say about the binding of the strong man. If you wanted to go check it out, because a number of people have messaged me privately wanting to uh, a link to the commentary. You will not find his commentary on this passage in Luke. You have to go back to the reference in Matthew. So there he talks about the strong man. And who is the strong man? He said, clearly, the strong man is the devil. He said, the strong man then in the passage is the devil. The house is the world. So you have to enter into the house because what? who is the prince of this world? That is the devil, according to our Lord. You have to enter into the house. The vessels are his arms, his goods, his instruments. The arms of the devil are fraud and deceit by which he entices men to sin. His arms are wealth, honors, and riches, and they, but yet they are inferior to God. So God, what does he do? He binds them. Now, Cordes Lapide takes this passage and he applies it to the visions that St. Anthony of the Desert had of Satan. He said quite literally, so there's a mystical sense that it's true that he binds a strong man, but he said in a literal sense, when, this, when Satan appears to St. Anthony of the Desert, he shows up in chains because he has been bound. He says, the devil 
according to uh, St. Anthony of the Desert, was hooked by the Lord like a dragon by the hook of the cross. It was taken in a dragnet and was bound like a fugitive slave, and his lips were perforated by a ring and a bracelet, and he is not permitted to devour any of the faithful now. And so this is a, it's amazing to see the images there. And finally, I want to end on Jerome, who said, there cannot be any uh, cooperation between God and Satan because they are completely uh, contrary to one another. The devil desires to captivate the souls of man, but the Lord delivers them. He, uh, the devil preaches idolatry, Christ, uh, the knowledge of the one God. Uh, the devil entices to vice, whereas Christ calls to virtue. How can they be agreement whenever they are all their works are contrary to one another? All right. Praise be to God. We are going to play our game. And so what we need is a caller on the line to play the game. And uh, if you're new here, we have three Catholic trivia questions, but you don't have to know the answers to win our game. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. But the phone number that you do need to call, and the phone lines are open right now at 877-757-9424. Call now. Be our first caller, and you get to be our contestant and possibly win the prize today. It's a $60 value at 877-757-9424. That's 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. We'll be right back. Call now. We all know children have a natural innocence and a sense of wonder. Yet our world is full of distractions that can pull families in the wrong direction. But with the help of God and a church family, your children can grow in the security of faith, hope, and love. Weekly Mass provides that critical faith foundation needed in life. So if your family hasn't been to Mass in a while, we'd like to invite you home. Discover more at catholicscomehome.org. Protestants like to use James 2, 10 through 11 against the Catholic doctrine of mortal and venial sin because James says whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. But James can't be denying the doctrine of mortal and venial sin because in 1.15 he affirms it, saying that sin in its beginning stages doesn't bring death, venial sin, whereas it does in its more mature stages, mortal sin. The point James is making in James 2, 10 through 11 is that we must keep all the commandments in order to avoid incurring the guilt of transgressing the law. We can't say to the Lord on Judgment Day, Lord, I only broke one commandment but kept the other nine. So James 2, 10 through 11 is simply a misfire in trying to take down the Catholic belief of mortal and venial sin. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. For 2,000 years, we've helped the poor and comforted the sick. We've educated generations of children, developed the scientific method and college system. We support marriage and human life. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are the Catholic Church. With over one billion in our family, sharing in the fullness of Christian faith and the church started by Jesus. If you've been away, visit catholicscomehome.org today. Welcome home. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. <laughs> the Catholic Trivia Game Show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe. Claim. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling, the Catholic Trivia Game Show, where we have a secret and hidden agenda. So don't uh, don't listen to that guy that we talked to yesterday. He was telling out the whole world all of my secrets. But here's the deal, okay? There are a few things that I will share with you, but you have to promise not to share them with others. Number one, we like to teach the faith. So we look for teachable moments in the questions, and you may just learn something you never knew before. Praise be to God. We like to have fun with our contestants, and they tend to be really good sports. They laugh with us, and we love that a lot. And then, of course, we give out prizes, kind of making this a winner for everybody involved. So it's kind of a good time. But here's the catch. Here's the rub. 
Our caller does not need to know the questions to still win the game. They could not know a single correct answer and still win our game. It's possible. And the reason is because I don't ask them these questions. Instead, I will ask Janice and I will ask Adrian. One of them will be right and the other will be wrong. And the caller will have 15 seconds on the clock to make a decision. Whom do they trust more? And every right answer goes into the coffee cup of Divine Providence to win this week's prize. And today is the day we will pull a name out of the coffee cup of Divine Providence and proclaim to you God's holy and divine will for whoever's going to get the prize. And what could they win, Janice? We have a great uh, sponsor this week. Uh, his name is Victor Mendoza. He's a, a young 23-year-old who started an Etsy shop called Mendoza Leather Goods, and he's giving away a $60 value leather sacred heart valet tray. Uh, his Instagram account is Mendoza Custom Leather. Uh, Fun fact, they're uh, a local to Tomball, Texas, and uh, they create custom leather goods for Catholics. Um, again, their Etsy shop is Mendoza Custom Leather. It's a $60 value valet tray with an embroidered sacred heart image um, engraved on it. And the great thing about this tray is that you can use it to place your sacramentals, your rosary, your holy water. Uh, it can be a great addition to your home altar. Yeah, praise be to God. That'd be awesome. All right. Well, we're very grateful to our sponsor. Check him out. You said on Etsy, right? Etsy. Etsy. Mendoza Custom Leather on Etsy. Check him out. Mm -hmm. And if you have an opportunity, tell him thank you for sponsoring Catholic Drive Time. We love that uh, when our listeners reach out to the sponsors and are grateful. All right. Let's go to the phones. Valerie, good morning to you. Thanks for being a part of our program. Good morning. Praise be to God, Valerie. Uh, where are you calling from again? Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, cattle capital of the world, probably. Uh, now, where do you go to church there? St. Elizabeth and Seton Keller. Oh, very nice. I've been there. It's been a long time. It's a very beautiful church. Praise be to God. And have you been listening? Do you, do you understand how this game is played? Oh, yes, sir. And well, wow. So you seem to have an opinion then, Valerie. Um, who's the trickiest, do you think? My, oh, geez, the trickiest. Uh, I think, um, oh, my gosh. It's okay. Say it. Admit, admit it. It's fine. It's just me and you. <laughs> Nobody else is listening. Uh, Adrian. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh my. But, yes. What? But, you know, I uh, can tell when he's being tricky. I know. Though. It's like you can read him like a book, right? Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. I agree. Oh, Truth bombs going down here on Catholic Drive Time. I agree with you, Valerie. I agree with you. I'm on your side. I'm, I am, I'm the one on your side today. So let's see if we can't get you into the coffee cup and possibly win today's prize. Are you ready to play? I am. All right. Praise be to God. We will start with Janice, as is her custom. Janice, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Are you sure? Yep. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Janice, can you tell me <laughs> what term refers to a celestial spirit assigned by God to watch over each person during their life? Mm, that would be the guardian angel. Okay. Yes, because okay. I, I remember as a little girl, I would pray the guardian angel prayer every You're, night. You don't pray it anymore? Well, I, as a little girl, I, I memorized it in Spanish. Yeah, sure. Oh, An, nice. Angel de mi guarda. Ah, yeah. very, very nice. Okay. Uh, if okay. you're if you're Hispanic, Valerie, I'm sure you know you know what yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So guardian angel. Let's oh. see what uh, brother Adrian has to say. Adrian, the tricky. Uh, Adrian, can you tell me what term refers to a celestial spirit? Assigned by God to watch over each person during life. Well, I pray the guardian angel prayer every day, and I don't remember that being in the guardian angel prayer. No? But I would say it's your patron saint. Patron saint? Mm hmm Ooh. Patron saints are celestial spirits? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Celestial now. refers to heaven. I see. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Praise be to God. Okay, so Valerie, here, here's the deal. Adrian says it's your patron saint, whereas Janice says it's your guardian angel. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? What say you, Valerie? Janice is right. You sound what? very confident. I don't, she just doesn't sound confident at all. Like, are what you, are you sure? I was 
Because oh. actually, when Adrian answered, I was going to go. Ouch. You should you should have done it, Valerie. Ouch. That would have been funny. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> you are right. Of course, it's the guardian angel, celestial spirits, Adrian. Good grief! Your patron saint is is body soul composite. But they're not humans in heaven because they don't have their body. We'll always be humans. Darn it! We'll never be angels. All right. Anyway. Uh, Guardian Angel, correct answer. You're in the cup. You could win. Praise be to God. Yeah. Let's see if we can't double your chances with question number two. We're going to go to Adrian this time. Adrian, can you tell me the material goods or monies given to the needy as a corporate work of mercy are called what? That's uh, alms for the poor. Ah, mm -hmm. it's very, it's like, you, say it like that. you became British all of a sudden. Is that, is that in canon law? <laughs> Do we have to say it that way every you, time? It's required. Alms for the poor. Yes. All right, let's see what uh, Janice says. Janice, can you tell me what uh, the material goods or monies given to the needy as a corporal work of mercy are called what? Tithing. Ah. So the mm. the material goods and monies that mm -hmm. we give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To the I, church, I or see. you I know, see. it's an act of mercy to tithe. Okay, okay. So here's the deal, Valerie. Uh, Jenny says it's tithing, uh, but Adrian says it's alms. Fifteen seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Valerie, what say you? Um, for the poor. <laughs> so she got it. <laughs> She got. I think she hears double points for that one. <laughs> Wait, what did she say? She, that was uh, that was well put, Valerie. Very good. Uh, you Very nailed good. the accent perfectly. You, clearly, you are somebody who does a lot of charity. I Amen. can tell. Amen. I can tell. All right, you're in for two, but I'm going to warn you. This next one is probably v the trickiest of all. We're going to go back to Jenny. Joe, you've picked the hardest questions. So. Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So, Janice, what is trination? Oh. Yeah. Exactly. What is trination? So, trination means the blessing of the people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, wow. So, wow. the Trinity is mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. yeah. persons in one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so. When we talk about the Trinity, Trination, yeah. uh, the priest is blessing everyone in it. the name of the Father, okay. Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Adrian, can you tell me what is Trination? What is Trination? So a priest is only allowed to uh, say one Mass a day okay. normally, okay. but he can get permission to binate or trinate. Really? So that's to say a second or even a third mass. So trination is permission to give a priest to, uh, permission to celebrate mass three times in one day. Fascinating. There you go. Okay, he, Valerie, here's the deal. We're up against the clock now. But Adrian says trination is to get permission to say up to three masses per day uh, or in a day. Whereas Janice seems to think trination is a blessing by the priest in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Valerie, what say you? Uh, I'm gonna go with Adrian. She sounds, sounds it's sad. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. I agree. <laughs> That's correct, but like, geez. <laughs> Perfect score, by the way. <laughs> that was a hard one, Valerie. That was hard. Wow. Was a very hard one. I think it demonstrates. I had a made up answer in my head. <laughs> I, was, I was really trying to trick her. <laughs> yes, Janice was throwing curveballs. You almost did. <laughs> Praise be to God. All right, Janice, do me a favor. Shake up the cup really good. Mix it all up. We have to pull a name out of the coffee cup. If Valerie, it could or it could not be you. I don't know. God's will be done. So just hang with us here. But she's shaking it up really well to make it f as fair as possible. And okay. then uh, you got right. a name yes. out of the coffee cup of divine providence. Ooh, so we actually got Valerie. Oh, oh. <laughs> that does not happen all that often, actually. Congratulations. <laughs> Yay. Valerie. I think it was the English accent I think that probably what did it. threw you <laughs> over. Alms for the poor. Yes. for the poor. All right. Well, praise be to God, Valerie. You were a lot of fun as usual. God bless you. God love you. Uh, but go, don't go anywhere. Stay on hold. We'll connect you to okay. your prize. But uh, thank you again for playing the game. You're welcome. Thank you for picking me. Amen. Have a great day, Valerie, and a great weekend. And that is going to do it for the radio side of our show this week. Praise be to God. Thank you all for everybody who joined us and the conversations we had. 
and uh, we're going to hang out on the live video feed for our after show where we will conversate casually about whatever is on your mind, your heart. You get to drive that. And if you don't, well, then we talk about movies and food. That's how that works. Join us on our website, grnonline.com forward slash CDT. grnonline.com forward slash CDT. God love you. God bless you. We'll see you on Monday. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's Facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Praise be to God. Welcome to the After Show uh, Friday edition of Catholic Drive Time, where we get a wee bit more un poquito... Un poco. Un poco. Un poco. Guess what language that is? That's French. Nope. Uh, German. Nix. Uh, Nix. Um, Nine. Uh, Latin. <laughs> uh, am I getting close? Yeah, how many languages do you actually know? I'm going to let, let, let you list them all off because <laughs> at some point I feel like we're going to plumb the depth. <laughs> of your language knowledge. Romanian. Romanian. That's not, a, not the correct answer. Russian? You are avoiding Polish. this country. Why are you avoiding this country? Is there something you have against Mandarin? this particular country? Cantonese. Do you dislike Vietnamese. the people in this country? Do Japanese? You, do you hate them for some odd reason? What, what, like, do, they what speak did they do to you? That's my question. Why Gaelic. do you hate all of the people Old in English? this country all of them everywhere, no matter where they're found on planet Earth. By Nordic. the way, there's a lot of them that speak this language. Hmm. Un poco. Raise your hand if you know what un poco either means and or what language that is. A little. Spanish. Un poco? Yeah. Un, no, un poquito is. Mm, un poco is something, is a different language. Um, un poquito is Spanish. Pretty sure un poco is, just means a little bit in Spanish. It means a little bit, but it's not Spanish. Um. Uh, mm, see, we go sidetracked very see. quickly. Jesus, uh, can you tell me is un poco a uh, Spanish word? Because I'm like 99 percent sure that this is Spanish. I 99. You're 99. I'm, I'm pretty darn certain. I'm pretty, pretty darn certain. You're pretty. That, that sounds reasonable, but not right. Sonia says it Italian. Is not Italian, but good guess, Sonia. At least you're in the How right. How did I not mention Italian? At least you're in the correct part was, of Europe. I was just like listening. Unlike Brother Adrian, who's going further and further east by the I mean, moment. <laughs> is it uh, Martian? <laughs> <laughs> have, we, have we reached that yet? Uh, aliens are demons. I thought we had this conversation. Hmm. Come on, man. Mike from Odyssey has got the correct answer. What did he say? Portuguese. 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 Hmm. Portuguese. Interesting. Well, un poco is Spanish as no, well. No, it is so not. There it, you go. John's even correct. He also mentions Portuguese. Well done. Well done. I don't know why Adrian hates all Portuguese people everywhere, but somehow, some way, he does. It's weird. I don't know. What did they do to you? That's my question. Uh, see, uh, have you ever had uh, chorizo? Have you ever had, uh, you know, some of the excellent Portuguese food? No, I'm Catholic. <laughs> so are they. Uh, Alejandra said, <laughs> un poco is Spanish, too. Thank you. No. Thank you. No. I'm like, I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I may not be fluent in Spanish, but like, geez, it's not a Wait. it's not like a complicated word. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Adrian. Mike says over Port over at Portuguese over at Ten, uh, hey, Odyssey.com. Technically, I, I didn't. First of all, I didn't know Mike was in Portugal right now. <laughs> Clarissa, <laughs> Second of all, Clarissa, <laughs> Clarissa's like it's about? Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Joaquin says Swahili. <laughs> 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 oh, un poco. My wife is aye, uh, aye. Portuguese by heritage. She's first uh, generation American. Her both her parents were immigrants from the Azores. First said it's also Greek, <laughs> and it's also Greek. It's possible. Well, there you go. It's possible. Can we talk about the trivia questions real no. quick? Mm -mm. I nope. think we need to talk I about these trivia it. questions. I forbid it. I think it's important. There will be no conversating about uh, trivia questions when you are intentionally trying to do harm to our listeners. I'm trying to. Uh, Make nuance. 
I'm, I have a big cup of nuance that I need to uh, <laughs> yeah. serve up. Yeah. Well, I mean, good grief. The, 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 the diversity. Un poco loco. The, the diversity in our questions today. Can you give me this easy answer, then that easy answer? And then what is the hardest question we can come up with? Yeah, like, that, yeah Joe, why are you coming what up with these the, hard questions, what, man? Where are we going with this? Um, like, wow. But technically speaking. Technically speaking. For question one, celestial spirits. Oh, that's the nuance saints. you want to go down. Yes. Patron humans saints. are humans and will always no. be humans. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because yes. a human is a body soul composite, like yes. you said. But will, in but heaven, we will get our you, bodies back. Yes, but at that moment, you're not a complete human. You are a celestial spirit. You're always going to be human, although you're going mm-hmm. to be lacking your body and you'll have a lack until you get it gets returned to you. But you will never not be anything other than human. You're never going to be an angel. You no, know, of course, you're not an angel. Right. But you're a celestial spirit. Your spirit uh, in I heaven. Know. I don't the know. I want a second spirit. opinion. I want a second opinion. I don't believe that's true. I'm what, did like, Thomas talk about this? I'm sure he did. Oh, you don't know. Let's Maybe look it see. up. Look it up. Let's see what Thomas but says. I'm just saying, like, a, the word celestial means heaven. heaven. A spirit is a mm-hmm. uh, a mm-hmm. the animating principle of a of a thing. And know, uh, the my and money, so humans. My money is that you're are always dead. human. You're always going to be considered human. You are disembodied human while you await the resurrection. Mm. But you're still just human. No, you're a human spirit. I know. But you're not actually you're human because you're human. lacking the a, a core principle of what it means to be human. What is Josh Patterson? Josh, do you put up with this every day at the apartment yes. complex? I'm just curious. The Reverend Bishop of the Gospel Church down the. <laughs> What is he talking about? The Reverend Bishop of the Gospel Church down the road told me when we die, we become angels. <laughs> well, there you go, folks. <laughs> He's spoken infallibly. Of the go- uh, okay, but Josh, here's a qualifying question. Was that a full gospel church? You got to ask these questions. Well, okay. here's the real question. Was it the first? What first? The church. Was it the first? The very first church yeah. ever? Mm-hmm. Down the road from your apartment complex. Right. I mean, well, it says like first Baptist, first <laughs> oh, Methodist. Oh, I see first, where you're going with that. First Christian. I see where you're going with that. Just, just got to make sure it's the first. Uh, Sonia. No, they're not. You don't become angels. No, absolutely not. You do not become angels because an angel is a species unto its own. Exactly. It's unto its own kind. And according yes. to Thomas, every angel is its own unique species. So even angels within... Angels between each other are not the same species. Which is, since we're speculating here, that's the one thing that I think is going to be fascinating to discover is how many species has God created that we will never even know about until the beatific vision. I mean, we probably will never be able to know about it because, like, it, literally every single angel is its own species. So that alone it, It's mind-blowing trillions. to think about, right? Like he, like he creates these creatures at the bottom of the ocean that you don't even know exist, but they're still down there and they're, they're still incredible, you know, or, or insects that we discover like, wow, I never even knew that existed. And you look at them and you're just like, this is amazing what God does. He creates things just for the sake of creating and, uh, and they're amazing. It gives, it gives him glory and we don't even know about it. It's just, I don't know, blows my mind, blows my mind. Which reminds me that aliens are actually demons <sighs> trying to manipulate people. Aye, aye. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is Friday it Friday? Can you tell it's Friday? <laughs> It's Friday. It's un poco day. It's un poco day. <laughs> un poco loco. Un poco loco day. I am like tired. I didn't get Me enough too. rest, and Me my neither. mind didn't want to work today. I, I feel like uh, I, I feel made like... the mistake of going to mass the last two days. You made the mistake of yes. going to mass because now I'm tired. I don't think you, you were. You meant what you said. Uh, well, you meant. I think you meant you're paying the price for sacrificing and going to mass the last two days. I think that's what you meant. Very sleepy. John, yeah, John says, I think you're splitting hairs. I have to side with Joe on this one. What? Yay and amen, no. John. Mm-mm. Yay and amen. Nope. Yeah, praise be to God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Incorrect. No. <laughs> Wrong. No. Duh. That's what I'm Blasphemy. saying right there. Heresy. Duh. I mean, it's obvious. I reject it. Captain Obvious. Entirely. Come on, man. I know it. It's true. Trying you will find... always be a human. However, in initially, it's only your spirit. It's your disembodied spirit. You're a disembodied human. Right, you're, you're a human, person. and the, you know the, the the real catch here is every person who dies, a hundred percent of all humanity, 
uh, is going to get their body back, whether they're in heaven or, or hell, ultimately. They're all going to get their bodies back and spend eternity with their body. In hell, it'll be punishments, which means physical pain, not just spiritual pain. And in heaven, it'll be pleasures, ecstasy with God, not just spiritual, but physical. So you're always just going to be a human. You're just waiting for your body back. Yeah, but you. But what is a human? A human is a body soul composite. True. And so if you don't have a, but if that you're doesn't not, you're make a disembodied it less spirit. true why you wait for your body back. But you're a disembodied spirit at that point. You're a disembodied human. But you're a you're no. But you're <laughs> you can't be a disembodied human because part of the definition of human mm -hmm. is to have a body. You still have a body. You're just not in it at the moment. Mm, you don't have the body. The body's not united with you. It's the union. I disagree. It's the union I, of the body look, and the soul. I, Thomas, what does Thomas say? I want to know. I don't, I'm trying to find you gotta it. you got to find it. see if he talks about it. Okay, we should phone a friend. Who, who can we call right now that would, that, let's see, uh, who could we call? Who could we call? Hmm, Michael Lofton? Should we call Lofton? Who do we call? Who do we call? Salmons? No, 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 no. Taylor Marshall? He won't take my call. Never mind. Uh, call you Dave Palmer. Dave Palmer. Uh, we should call Dave. Let me see if I get Dave Palmer on the line here. Uh, let's see. see, see Dave I'm trying to see. I, I can't find where he talks about death. That's a good call. Let's call Christmas. Dave Palmer up. Um, Dave Palmer, are you listening to us? I'm just curious. Let's see. Dave. Let's see. Dave, can you jump on a call? On a on our show quickly, let's see what he has to say. I, I'm trying to do this without glasses. It's a mistake. We need to answer a question here, a deep dividing question. Mary Brown says there is there is a plant spirit, animal spirit, human spirit, and divine spirit. We always have a human spirit. You're so you're both right, Mary. You got to commit, okay? You can't play both well, sides that's what, like exa that. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying, yes, you have a, your soul is not, it doesn't become an angel, but you're still a celestial spirit because you're a spirit well, I, in I'm heaven. I'm not arguing with the celestial part. That just means heaven. It's, that's what I'm saying. But <laughs> the idea that you're trying to suggest that you're somehow less human, I mean, you're, you are in the sense that you're awaiting your body, but you're still, you're, you identify you who you are, your whatness has not changed you are still human wait what is the question that you guys are asking that's a good question i don't know the question we're asking <laughs> what are we asking actually <laughs> all i was saying all we're arguing over this... we're, we're debating we're discussing over the question the first question of the trivia was what term refers to a celestial spirit assigned by god to watch over each person during life and his answer was what'd you say I god said a, he's a patron, patron saint. saint and i'm like well that's a human it can't be and he's he's saying, and I'm saying, be. I mean, the answer is obviously guardian angel, but I'm, so my point is simply that, technically speaking, a saint is a celestial spirit. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Christopher Chance is like, are we really going to discuss this whole after? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we get Dave Palmer on to settle it, he's not responded to me yet. I'm sorry, Christopher. What do you want to talk about, Christopher? Let, tell me what's on your mind. I'd love to know. Uh, we should, we should talk God. about Tri-Nation. Tri-Nation, another <laughs> argument. No, that's not an argument. It's not it's really. really. Yeah, it's a be, tricky question, though. It is a tricky question, because most people have never heard the term before. But, yeah, real quickly, a priest, technically speaking, so you should uh, know this for Sunday Masses, can only say one Mass a day. That's like in general. Now, most places, the bishop is given permission for a priest to binate, which is to say two Masses in, on one day. Uh, and then in, in some cases, even... They are allowed to trinate, which is to say three masses in one day. Now, this is really a grave abuse. They really should not be doing this um, in general, because especially whenever you have like three masses in one day and all the masses are like 20 percent full, it's like just have them all go to the same mass. Like, sorry, you got, we got to wake up earlier um, and not have to say three masses in one day. It's not healthy for a priest to do that because it breeds a. Uh, over familiarity with the liturgy oh, and and it causes them it causes priests to have disdain for the liturgy because they're reading the same readings doing the same everything and giving the same sermon three times in a row and it kind of jades priest and it wears them out and so yeah. priests really should only be doing one mass every every week every day i mean rather um so yeah and and if they're doing they cannot do more than three 
So a bishop cannot, with unless there's grave, grave reason, they cannot get permission for them to do more than three masses in a day. So there you go. That's Trination. Hey, Amber and Forrest, thanks for hanging out with us on our website today. Praise be to God. Good to, uh, good to see you there. Uh, Michelle Vaughn said, human, mind, body, spirit. What happens to the mind post-life? The mind is part of the soul. So there is a, it's really the only thing, there's only two distinctions. It's body, soul. That's the only distinction that's being made. And because the mind is actually a principle of the spirit of the soul. So whenever you die, you're, you still retain your mind. Your brain is not your mind. So when like, for instance, you get Alzheimer's and your brain stops working, your mind is still uh, resides in the soul. So your soul is not damaged. So when you go to heaven, you're not going to have Alzheimer's anymore because the mind resides in the soul, even though the physical body, like the, uh, the brain may be damaged or may be decaying, uh, but your soul won't. What is everybody up to this weekend? I'm curious. <clears throat> I can't wait to uh, wrap up today and head out, try to do some hunting, camping. You're saying you don't want to hang out son. with me anymore? Um, no. You're welcome to come, in fact. You want to come ha- hunt and camp? I kind of do. But come on nah, down, I, I need to get a hunting license. Well, know. there's always that, isn't there? <laughs> how, how does that work with your son? Does yeah. your, you have the license, but... No, he has one, too. Oh, nice. In the, state of, in the state of Texas, it depends on the state you live in, but each state has their own regulations. Now, um, <clears throat> his license is very, very inexpensive. He does, so the younger you are, the less is required. So because mm-hmm. he's under 17, there, there's, mm-hmm. he has very little to do to, <clears throat> to overcome that. Mm. Uh, Dave Palmer said he he would he said he would join us. I'm gonna give him the phone number. Sweet. Eight seven 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 five seven. He doesn't have a memory. Nine four two four. Let's see if he calls in. Uh, he has very little to overcome. He just has to pay. The, I think it's like seven bucks for him, mm. and then he doesn't have to get anything else. He can hunt uh, every other uh, everything else. So there's depends on the animal. You might have to have some endorsements that you have to pay extra for. He doesn't have to do any of that. He gets special seasons because he's young, so he gets a lot of opportunity. Mm. <clears throat> young people have a lot of opportunity in the state of Texas. Each state's different, though. And I'm sure young people are treated be- well in every state, but Texas is pretty good. Dave Palmer. Oh, sorry. Hey, hey Dave. Um, how you doing, by the way, before we jump into this? Uh, I'm doing fine. I'm already on, right? Yes, yeah, you, are, you are on the app. We're in the after <laughs> show, so it's just social media, but... It's, it's just us oh, hanging okay. out, so don't worry about it. But uh, there is a deep and a profound uh, argument going on that needs a third opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, All right. And since you are an expert. The leading expert in the world, actually. Of, of Thomistic to me. theology philosophy. <laughs> we thought of you. Does that make sense? Yeah, I might have called Dr. Peter Cray first, but. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so here's the. I'm going to first read you the question that we are discussing. This was a trivia question during our game show today. The question went What term refers to a celestial spirit assigned by God to watch over each person during life? The correct answer was guardian angel. Adrian, to try to be tricky, said patron saint. I, of course, thought it's a human. You can't be the correct answer because you just named a human. A human is not a celestial spirit. Right. And so what? Hold on. What say you, Dave Palmer? <clears throat> well, are you saying whether a patron saint can be an angel? No, 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 no. So, OK, a let me celestial let me say spirit. So I was saying I said, well, technically speaking, a patron saint is a celestial spirit because it is a disembodied spirit. It's not a human entirely anymore because it's a, not a body soul composite any longer. And it is a spirit residing in the celestial realm, heaven. Therefore, technically speaking, a patron saint is a celestial spirit. What say you, Dave Palmer? Uh, I think I need another hour of sleep. <laughs> now, I argued well, that, no, well, 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 humans me, are never uh, anything but humans. When we're dead and we're waiting our body, we are still just humans awaiting our body. Uh, well, no, we're, no. when you're dead awaiting your body, you're not a human. You're a, you're a separated soul. But Thank we're you. a Except human that, uh, waiting our bodies back. We're no, a, you know, a human being has to be a composite of body yeah. and soul. So as soon as you, your soul separates from your body, you're, not, you're a corpse. One part of you is a corpse, and one part of you is a separated soul. But you're no longer a human being until the two come together again. Have you two been? So the human being has here? to. Have, <laughs> no, a human being has to has to be a composite because 
it's it's kind of yeah because you're you, you, uh, you, you know, the, the, it's, it's 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 integral to the nature of a human being to have a body soul composite so the you know, you know, I'll grant you're you're you know my 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 father who died and I trust is in heaven right now is not a human being he, he's he's awaiting his his uh, the reunion of his bo- his his soul and his body but he's he's a, he's a separated soul and his body is you know six feet under in, uh, here on earth so it's you're horrible. saying <laughs> Patron saint could actually be a correct answer to uh, God assigning a celestial spirit to a watch over a person. No, because it's not assigned by God to watch over. Well, I, or whether it is or it isn't is not the question. If God so chose to assign a celestial spirit, He could choose. I mean, of course, He can do whatever He wants. But to just be technical about this question, He could choose uh, a human instead of a guardian angel. Hmm. <laughs> I guess, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, no, no. You're, you're confusing me with celestial spirit because well, that was the term for the also, question. Yeah, wouldn't it also the Holy Spirit could be, uh, and, and and even God the Father could be called a celestial spirit? Wouldn't you believe uh, that? Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess well, well, I, I, I'm, I'm a little confused by the whole celestial thing. Well, that was part that of the question: like, was celestial yeah, spirit he, he, kind of heavenly or? To me, uh, the, the term. It refers to angels. Yeah, right, and, right. And humans don't qualify. And I, I still come back to a human who's died is still just a human waiting their body back. They're disembodied human, but they're still just human. Their whatness hasn't changed in the sense that they haven't become something else. They're a human who is now disembodied from their body and will get their body back uh, either for good or for bad. Yeah, but I still have a problem calling them a human because I don't think they're. I don't think those awaiting the reunion of their bodies are human beings. Their their, their nature has been disrupted, mm-hmm. and uh, and they've temporarily taken on a, a different nature because uh, it's they, they they don't have their body. And that, that's why Tom, Thomas Aquinas says that he, the separated souls in heaven are, are even though you know they're in a state of happiness, they are longing <laughs> for their bodies. So there's still there's still a longing for their bodies. So there's some, you know, lack of completion that they have right now. So I I, I think I think we're probably splitting hairs. What would Thomas? We say? are definitely splitting what, hairs. What Thomas Aquinas say? Do you know? Has Thomas spoken on that at all? I'm just curious. Uh, you mean specifically to your question? Yeah, about whether or not they're called humans in purgatory, for instance, uh, or um, in the civic vision, or in hell, or heaven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would. I don't know if he used that exact terminology, but I, I, I think he does say that for a human being to be a human being, it's integral to a human being to have a composite, and 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 clearly, when the soul separates from the body, you, you are no longer an integrated composite being, and and therefore you're no longer a human being. Um, you're you're a potentially reunited human being, but not. Not in that state, and that's why, like the Blessed Mother, would be a human being because, and and perhaps Saint Joseph and some of these others who had bodily assumptions, they they never lost the in, in, integrity of their human beingness, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, but and they, maybe that's one of the great dignities of our Blessed Mother that the rest of us don't enjoy, is we never have to suffer that disintegration even temporarily. Well, there you go, folks. There you go. That's why we know. called the expert. Exactly. Uh, can we can we put a uh, can we put a pin in this now? Uh, a fork? Can, or no. What, do we do? what we can say is, is completely uh, answered. That or Dave Palmer agreed with me, and that uh, <laughs> that I that feel is it's settled. Not resolved. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, by the way, can I can I mention one other thing, Joe? Sure. If you don't mind, because it's it's very go related it. to mystic philosophy yeah. today on uh, Back to the Father, and this is something that. Yeah, you guys can can discuss sometime on your show as well. We're talking about is is natural law dead, mm. and mm. the whole the whole premise is, is since the, the the world has pretty much thrown out natural law, is it dead? And I'm kind of comparing comparing it to Nietzsche saying God is dead, which which a, a sane person would laugh at, right? And and so it's uh, it's totally unrelated to celestial spirits, but I, I just wanted to. Uh, <laughs> now that's coming uh, you, you up today know. at two. 2 p.m. Central. Yeah, today, t- today at two. Yeah, is natural law dead? All right. And, Are you going to uh, talk about uh, Aristotle's revenge? 
Um, only if uh, you, only if you call in and talk about what that means. No, that's uh, uh, Edward Fazer wrote a book called Aristotle's Revenge, and it's on the natural law. He's like talking about how natural. Essentially, he's saying natural law is dead, and because of that, uh, Aristotle's revenge is happening. Where we've trying to we've tried to get rid of natural law, but obviously it's impossible to completely get rid of natural law because it's natural uh and so there is like they were having all these horrible <laughs> things happen to society and humans because of that uh, yeah, i'm just seeing some yeah. of the commentary people are like this is too deep it's too much <laughs> all right well praise be to god dave palmer uh thanks for hanging out with us and having a little bit of fun diving into the yeah. uh the errors of uh, Thomistic philosophy. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Don't what, think what I meant was, what I meant was, <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. Hey, thanks for letting me Lynch. get a part of yeah. the show. Tune in to Back to the Father, 2 p.m. today on our live video feeds. Uh, praise be to God, uh, Dave Palmer. Again, have a great day. Thanks, Joe. All right. Bye-bye. Mike over in Odyssey is throwing out dad jokes. That's how desperate we're getting here. Oh, no. He says, did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? No. A great food. Just no atmosphere. I thought we didn't go to the moon. I thought the moon landing was fake. We were there, totally. Uh, Mike Mike said he did have a joke about fighting, but he's since forgotten the punchline. Can't remember it. He says, I decided to sell my vacuum cleaner. It was just collecting dust. (laughs) Yikes. That's a good one. I like that. (laughs) Clarissa asks, uh, she says she's planning to go to Mass this weekend. Hopefully, we'll have dinner with her sister and brother. Praise be to God. Uh, She wanted to know what mass I was going to. So I'm looking at Our Lady of Atonement, possibly, for Sunday. The problem is I don't know for sure exactly which mass. Uh, It could be that I try to get to that 11 o'clock solemn high. Um, The question is, this comes down to whether or not the hunting works out the way I think it will. Uh, Because it can be tricky sometimes. And so I'm either going to try to pack up Sunday morning and get to the 11 o'clock mass, which should be about an hour away from the campsite. A little more than an hour, actually. So I don't know. If not that one, maybe maybe I might even have to stay for the 5 o'clock and then head home after, which will make for a late evening. But that's that's the way it goes. So I'm not sure yet. I'm just not sure. Uh, but uh, if I see you, I'd love to see you. If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, if you catch me a mass, uh, come and say hello. I'd love to, love to shake your hand. Mary Barone said, "Everyone gets an angel. I would propose that perhaps we get a guardian saint as well, if God so chooses. We actually do. Uh, the day that we're born, uh, we have that patron saint of the person that we're uh, we're named after, and the person that we're the day that we're born. Which is why typically it was traditional in Catholic countries and Catholic nations for you to be named after the saint that you were born on. So yes, you actually do have a a guardian saint. Plus, you could pick your confirmation saint as well. So that too. Um, and I think sometimes saints choose us, like befriending, like they. Like, I feel like there's a there's a couple of saints that have come into my life uh, occasionally. Like, they just come, they just coincidentally always show up in my life. And so I think, the, you know, we, we can definitely look at the saints as friends and see the opportunity of, like, befriending the saints and having, you know, whichever saint you want to have as a patron, especially when you are confirmed, when you're doing confirmation as a teenager, most, most often you can choose your saint. Yeah, um, I felt that way about Padre Pio. I felt like he was harassing me. Mm. Uh, I think you were harassing him. Just saying, maybe. <laughs> uh, but he was uh, chasing me down for a long time until I gave in. Uh, Glenn Trahan says the difference between a clown, or what is the difference between a clown and a rabbit that exercises? Any any guesses? Energizer Bunny. Uh, one is a bit funny, and the other is a fit bunny. Nice. <laughs> uh, Chris said, did you hear the one about the guy who lost his left part of his body? No. He's all right now. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, Josh said, ask Dave what body we get in heaven. How old are we? Are we all peak 25-year-olds? Do we get to yeah. look like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah. Uh, no, probably not. Probably 33. I, I have a friend that says that we're, we'll all become children. Um, in heaven, it's oh, like no, no. It, it's Technically, like, uh, we're we're all taller, leaner, with longer arms. No, Ever, <laughs> except for Joe, it's he gets true. shorter arms. It's true, <laughs> shorter. No, yeah. I already have the T Rex package. I'm looking for taller and leaner and longer arms. Yeah, I don't think we'll be children. I mean, I guess analogously, you could say we're children. 
uh, like the image, mm-hmm. the icon of Our Lady in Heaven uh, with the swaddling clothing <laughs> and Our Lord carrying her because she's a, a newborn in the kingdom of heaven. But uh, no, I think we'll, we'll be we'll be like Our Lord. We'll be fully grown adults. Um, are you sure? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Are, are you sure? I'm like almost certain. Clarissa says, a priest, a rabbi, and a Buddhist walk into a bar. They all say, ouch. <laughs> Ouch. But I'm bummed. Where's my where's my button? <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. I don't know, man. What's going on? There you go, folks. Uh Mike, Mike the third is, one ducked. Mike is reminiscing about our conversation. He says it's like uh, conversations they had on Midwatch. That's true. What's in the Midwatch. In the military you have watches, right? You um you stay in your watch. And uh boy, we get into the most philosophical questions. When you had the time, to, you know, when you were on these uh, opportunities, especially in the middle of the night, third watches where you're you're up all night long with your friends and or you're not your friends, but your your colleagues and uh, you had nothing else to do. And this is before the Internet. You couldn't Google stuff or be on social media. You sat there and you talked philosophy oh, almost always, you know. Oh, man, I can th- I'm thinking about times where uh, me and a, a, another guy served in the same unit. <laughs> we go get a six pack and sit at the dock and on and uh at, uh, at the, on the Kenai Peninsula there in Hawaii. And That's our roommate, me and my roommates and every just day. just talk about that all night long. Clarissa said, my husband wanted to share that. He's dead now, clearly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, yeah. I heard uh, there's another one. There's like two guys walking to a bar. The third one ducks. <laughs> the third one figured it out. Well, I guess that's enough of that silliness. By the way, uh, Monday, we don't have a guest. So it looks like we have work to do. No, we have um, our pre record interview. Oh, Henry Sear. Henry, either Henry Sear will be our guest on Monday or, or a Christopher Columbus guest. Yeah. One or the other. Christopher Columbus. Make Christopher Columbus great again. That's what I say. Uh, so we'll cover we'll cover that probably on Monday. But then uh, see Dr. Greg Botaro, Catholic Psych Institute, is on Tuesday. So we have some work to do to fill up our schedule. But as usual, we're going to look for some great guests and have great and interesting conversations. And we're grateful to all of you for being a part of it. Praise be to God. God love you all. Have a great weekend, whatever you're doing this weekend. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully you are too. I guess we'll see you back here on Monday. Do us a favor and share us with a friend. Praise be to God. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have a friend in Jesus. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. He taught me how to live my life as it should be. He taught me how to turn my cheek when people laugh at me. I've had friends before, and I can tell you that he's one who will never leave you flat.